Lesson 5 Children of the Promise Sabbath Afternoon April 24 For a few weeks past, I have had a deep sense of the promises of God and the hope of the Christian. The Bible never seemed to me so full of rich gems of promise as within the last few weeks. It seems that the dews of heaven are ready to fall upon us and refresh us if we will only take the promises to ourselves. We can never overcome our own natural tendencies without the help of heaven, and the precious Jesus places himself right by our side to help us in this work. He says, Lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Matthew chapter 28, verse 20. We want to believe just what Christ has said. We want that our faith shall compass the promises. In Heavenly Places, page 118. Christ took humanity upon himself. He laid aside his royal robe and kingly crown and stepped down from his high command in the heavenly courts. Clothing his divinity with humanity, Christ encircled the race with his long human arm. He stands at the head of humanity not as a sinner, but as a savior. It is because there is no spot or stain of sin upon his divine soul that he can stand there as the sinner's surety. Because he is sinless, he can take away our sins and place us on vantage ground with God, if we will believe in him and trust him as the one that will be our sanctification and righteousness. Lift him up, page 93. What kind of faith is it that overcomes the world? It is that faith which makes Christ your own personal Savior, that faith which, recognizing your helplessness, your utter inability to save yourself, takes hold of the Helper who is mighty to save as your only hope. It is faith that will not be discouraged, that hears the voice of Christ saying, Be of good cheer, I have overcome the world, and my divine strength is yours. It is the faith that hears him say, Lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Christ should never be out of the mind. The angel said concerning him, Thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Jesus, precious Savior, assurance, helpfulness, security, and peace are all in him. He is the dispeller of all our doubts, the earnest of all our hopes. How precious is the thought that we may indeed become partakers of the divine nature, whereby we may overcome as Christ overcame. Jesus is the fullness of our expectation. He is the melody of our songs, the shadow of a great rock in a weary land. He is living water to the thirsty soul. He is our refuge in the storm. He is our righteousness, our sanctification, our redemption. When Christ is our personal Savior, we shall show forth the praises of Him who hath called us out of darkness into His marvelous light. Reflecting Christ, page 21 Sunday, April 25 Thy Shield When trials arise that seem unexplainable, we should not allow our peace to be spoiled. However unjustly we may be treated, let not passion arise. By indulging a spirit of retaliation, we injure ourselves. We destroy our own confidence in God and grieve the Holy Spirit. There is by our side a witness, a heavenly messenger, who will lift up for us a standard against the enemy. He will shut us in with the bright beams of the Son of Righteousness. Beyond this, Satan cannot penetrate. He cannot pass this shield of holy light. Christ's Object Lessons, pages 171 and 172. When his people shall be in the greatest danger, seemingly unable to stand against the power of Satan, God will work in their behalf. Man's extremity is God's opportunity. I am so thankful at this time that we can have our minds taken off from the difficulties that surround us and the oppression that is to come upon the people of God and can look up to the heaven of light and power. If we place ourselves on the side of God, of Christ, and the heavenly intelligences, the broad shield of omnipotence is over us, the mighty God of Israel is our helper, and we need not fear. 
Selected Messages, Book 2, page 373. We must have that faith which works by love and purifies the soul, that this belief in Christ will lead us to put away everything that is offensive in His sight. Unless we have this faith that works, it is of no advantage to us. You may admit that Christ is the Savior of the world, but is He your Savior? Do you believe today that He will give you strength and power to overcome every defect in your character? We have individually this lesson to learn of special trust in our Savior. We are to trust our Heavenly Father just as a child trusts its earthly parents and believe that He is working for our good in all things, and that every struggling cry and every effort against the adversary of our soul enters into the ears of the God of Sabaoth, and that He will send us help every time we need it. He will help us over every temptation if we call upon Him in faith. In Heavenly Places, page 118. If we commit ourselves to God, we have the assurance, He will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that ye may be able to bear it. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. The only safeguard against evil is the indwelling of Christ in the heart through faith in His righteousness. It is because selfishness exists in our hearts that temptation has power over us. But when we behold the great love of God, selfishness appears to us in its hideous and repulsive character, and we desire to have it expelled from the soul. As the Holy Spirit glorifies Christ, our hearts are softened and subdued, the temptation loses its power, and the grace of Christ transforms the character. Thoughts from the Mount of Blessing, page 118 Monday, April 26 The Messianic Promise, Part 1 to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. Galatians chapter 3, verse 16. Abraham himself was to share the inheritance. The fulfillment of God's promise may seem to be long delayed, for one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 8. It may appear to tarry, but at the appointed time, it will surely come. It will not tarry. Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 3. The gift to Abraham and his seed included not merely the land of Canaan, but the whole earth. So says the Apostle. The promise that he should be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. Romans chapter 4 verse 13. And the Bible plainly teaches that the promises made to Abraham are to be fulfilled through Christ. All that are Christ's are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Heirs to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and that fadeth not away. The earth freed from the curse of sin. Galatians chapter 3 verse 29 and 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 4. For the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High and the meek shall inherit the earth, and shall delight themselves in the abundance of peace. Daniel chapter 7 verse 27, and Psalm 37 verse 11. Patriarchs and Prophets, page 169. It was a high honor to which Abraham was called, that of being the father of the people who for centuries were the guardians and preservers of the truth of God for the world of that people through whom all the nations of the earth should be blessed in the advent of the promised Messiah. His religion was not held as a precious treasure to be jealously guarded and enjoyed solely by the possessor. True religion cannot be thus held, for such a spirit is contrary to the principles of the gospel. While Christ is dwelling in the heart, it is impossible to conceal the light of his presence or for that light to grow dim. On the contrary, it will grow brighter and brighter as day by day the mists of selfishness and sin that envelop the soul are dispelled by the bright beams of the Son of Righteousness. God's Amazing Grace, page 56 Through the beloved John, the Holy Spirit declared to the churches, This is the record that God hath given to us eternal life, 
and this life is in his Son. He that hath a Son hath life. 1 John chapter 5, verses 11 and 12. And Jesus said, I will raise him up at the last day. Christ became one flesh with us in order that we might become one spirit with him. It is by virtue of this union that we are to come forth from the grave, not merely as a manifestation of the power of Christ, but because, through faith, his life has become ours. Those who see Christ in his true character and receive him into the heart have everlasting life. It is through the Spirit that Christ dwells in us, and the Spirit of God, received into the heart by faith, is the beginning of the life eternal. The Desire of Ages, page 388 Tuesday, April 27 The Messianic Promise, Part 2 the people of God are His representatives upon the earth, and He intends that they shall be lights in the moral darkness of this world. Scattered all over the country, in the towns, cities, and villages, they are God's witnesses, the channels through which He will communicate to an unbelieving world the knowledge of His will and the wonders of His grace. It is His plan that all who are partakers of the great salvation shall be missionaries for Him. The piety of the Christian constitutes the standard by which worldlings judge the gospel. Trials, patiently borne, blessings, gratefully received, meekness, kindness, mercy, and love, habitually exhibited, are the lights that shine forth in the character before the world. God's Amazing Grace, page 56. I hath not seen, nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9 As the sinner, drawn by the power of Christ, approaches the uplifted cross and prostrates himself before it, there is a new creation. A new heart is given him. He becomes a new creature in Christ Jesus. Holiness finds that it has nothing more to require. God himself is the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. Romans chapter 3 verse 26. And whom he justified, them he also glorified. Romans chapter 8 verse 30. Great as is the shame and degradation through sin, even greater will be the honor and exaltation through redeeming love. To human beings striving for conformity to the divine image, there is imparted an outlay of heaven's treasure, an excellency of power that will place them higher than even the angels who have never fallen. Christ's Object Lessons, page 162. If we could have but one view of the celestial city, we would never wish to dwell on earth again. There, when the veil that darkens our vision shall be removed, and our eyes shall behold that world of beauty of which we now catch glimpses through the microscope, when we look on the glories of the heavens now scanned afar through the telescope, when the blight of sin removed, the whole earth shall appear in the beauty of the Lord our God. What a field will be open to our study! There the student of science may read the records of creation and discern no reminders of the law of evil. He may listen to the music of nature's voices and detect no note of wailing or undertone of sorrow. In all created things he may trace one handwriting. In the vast universe, behold, God's name writ large, and not in earth or sea or sky one sign of ill remaining. Let your imagination picture the home of the saved and remember that it will be more glorious than your brightest imagination can portray. In the varied gifts of God and nature, we see but the faintest gleaming of His glory. Human language is inadequate to describe the reward of the righteous. It will be known only to those who behold it. No finite mind can comprehend the glory of the paradise of God. The Faith I Live By Page 364 Wednesday, April 28 A Great and Mighty Nation Often the Israelites seemed unable or unwilling to understand God's purpose for the heathen. 
Yet it was this very purpose that had made them a separate people and had established them as an independent nation among the nations of the earth. Abraham, their father, to whom the covenant promise was first given, had been called to go forth from his kindred to the regions beyond that he might be a light bearer to the heathen. Although the promise to him included a posterity as numerous as the sand by the sea, yet it was for no selfish purpose that he was to become the founder of a great nation in the land of Canaan. God's covenant with him embraced all the nations of earth. I will bless thee, Jehovah declared, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing, and I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee and in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. Genesis chapter 12, verses 2 and 3. Prophets and Kings, page 367. God gave to Abraham a view of an immortal inheritance, and with this hope he was content. By faith he sojourned in the land of promise, as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he looked for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Hebrews chapter 11 verses 9 and 10. Of the posterity of Abraham it is written, These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, and were persuaded of them, and embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. Verse 13. We must dwell as pilgrims and strangers here if we would gain a better country, that is, an heavenly. Verse 16. Those who are children of Abraham will be seeking the city which he looked for, whose builder and maker is God. Patriarchs and Prophets, page 170. Christians will be in this world and holy nation, a peculiar people, showing forth the praises of him who hath called them out of darkness into his marvelous light. This light is not to grow dim, but to shine brighter and brighter unto the perfect day. Christ's standard bearers are never to be off duty. They have a vigilant foe who is waiting and watching to take the fort. Some of Christ's professed watchmen have invited the enemy into their stronghold, have mingled with them, and in their efforts to please have broken down the distinction between the children of God and the children of Satan. The thrilling truth that has been sounding in our ears for many years, the Lord is at hand, be ye also ready, is no less the truth today than when we first heard the message. Testimonies for the Church Volume 5, page 14. Thursday, April 29. Make your name great. The Lord selected Abraham to carry out his will. He was directed to leave his idolatrous nation and separate from his kindred. The Lord had revealed himself to Abraham in his youth and gave him understanding and preserved him from idolatry. He designed to make him an example of faith and true devotion for his people who should afterward live upon the earth. His character was marked for integrity, generosity, and hospitality. He commanded respect as a mighty prince among the people. His reverence and love for God and his strict obedience in performing his will gained for him the respect of his servants and neighbors. His godly example and righteous course, united with his faithful instructions to his servants and all his household, led them to fear, love, and reverence the God of Abraham. Spiritual Gifts, Volume 3, page 98 the Jews claimed to have descended from Abraham, but by failing to do the works of Abraham, they proved that they were not true children of his. Only those who are spiritually in harmony with him are reckoned as true descent. There are in our world today many wounded, cheerless hearts who need relief. The Lord has agencies for brightening the lives of these disconsolate ones. We may each put our talents out to usury by lifting the clouds and letting in the sunlight of hope and faith in Him who so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. John chapter 3 verse 16 
This Day with God, page 183. Man, fallen man, may be transformed by the renewing of the mind so that he can prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. How does he prove this? By the Holy Spirit taking possession of his mind, spirit, heart, and character. Where does the proving come in? We are made a spectacle unto the world and to angels and to men. A real work is wrought by the Holy Spirit upon the human character, and its fruits are seen. We see by experience that in our own human strength, resolutions and purposes are of no avail. Must we then give up our determined efforts? No. Although our experience testifies that we cannot possibly do this work ourselves, help has been laid upon one who is mighty to do it for us. But the only way we can secure the help of God is to put ourselves wholly in His hands and trust Him to work for us. As we lay hold of Him by faith, He does the work. The believer can only trust. As God works, we can work, trusting in Him and doing His will. Ellen G. White comments in the SDA Bible Commentary, Volume 6, page 1080. For further reading, God's Amazing Grace, Christ's Representative, page 196, and Patriarchs and Prophets, The Test of Faith, pages 145 to 155.